Hey, Karma Weeks here, Fantasy of Flight, and we got a little special treat here. We did a lot of filming. Rick's been working on this particular panel right here, and Phil basically followed him the process of taking it off, doing all the work, and putting it back together again. So uh, uh, let's follow Rick along and uh, see how he created this beautiful masterpiece. Rick Reeves here at Fantasy of Flight. I'm going to be doing some additional voiceover for this Saversky P35 Mechanics Corner Clip. So what we're doing here is fitting the uh, wing into our, our fixture that we're fortunate enough to purchase. We have bought this with the intent to fit different wings to it, so we're able to adapt it accordingly to wings up to a certain size. So it works out a lot for us in different applications. As you can see here, we're tightening it up to the plates that we've had made for the wing root. Now all placed firmly in all the hard points. Today I'm going to go ahead and start drilling off the top skins. I've got all the bottom skins drilled up, um, made new. So at this point I'm going to start removing everything off the top and repeating everything. As I tear them down, I'm going to remake them, uh, put all the holes in them, all the cutouts so I'll be ready to go and uh, to sand out for polish. So I'll start drilling out today. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take one particular skin off the right wing of the P-35 and we're going to follow this thing through from start to finish. Uh, kind of give you a good idea of what's involved in the process. I'm here I'm, I'm drilling out just the heads of the rivet, the thickness of the head of the rivet with the drill size that's needed. The reason for that is I try to leave the bucktails into the material underneath the skin so it kind of holds it together for me otherwise this thing will start coming apart before I'm ready for it to so by doing it this way it's going to allow me to remove the skin and yet still hold most or majority of the structure together firmly if it uh, doesn't work out that way I can apply a Clico or something to like that I had to speed up the process obviously Here what I'm doing is just uh, removing the heads of the rivets that I've already drilled through, popping them out, and just taking them out with a chisel one by one. Nothing's being damaged to this. Obviously, if I was going to save this skin, I probably would do it a little bit differently than risking marking the skin, but knowing that I'm replacing it, this is the most efficient way to remove the large amount of rivets that are in the skin. The other plus to this is it's going to leave the bucktails in so all the intersections will hopefully stay together so that the wing doesn't get flimsy on me. Alright, so now you can see as I remove the heads of the rivets off, the skin's starting to become free off the, the surface. At this point, I'll go ahead and just work down the, the field of rivets and work myself to the center of the skin so it's kind of held there, kind of centered, balanced more or less, and then I'll remove the last few rivets at that point. So at this point, the, the final rivet's about to come out. I'll go ahead and remove the skin and then be able to carry it to the table and better look over the skin, see if I have any damage I need to address before I start drilling the skin up. So at this point I'll go ahead and have some damaged area here so I'll straighten this out kind of so it doesn't hold my uh, pattern off the new skin as I drill it up. And wipe it clean and set it up on the new skin and start drilling it up. So at this point what I'm doing is I'm wiping off the extra burrs, the dust, the dirt, the debris from the years that this airplane's been together. So I'm looking over several things as I go. I'm looking for damage, looking for anything that might indicate that I'm having a repair in the skin so I can eliminate that as I make the new part. Obviously looking for corrosion which isn't really relevant because the skin's getting replaced notice here that there's corrosion so that shows you a good example of why we take some of these apart so we can evaluate what's inside you can't see when it's together 
this would have been missed if this airplane didn't come apart. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to place this in the English wheel. I've placed the flat small wheel on the wheel as well and my objective here is I've got a small ripple within the skin that's going to affect me allowing the skin to sit flat on the new material to drill it up. So I'll go ahead and roll this out with a mild amount of pressure within the wheel to somewhat flatten the area that's been wrinkled. It works to my advantage to do it this way. I'm taking it as far as I can here. So at this point what I'll do is I'll go to the table. I'm going to work it a little bit with the shot bag and my soft hammer. Try to remove it that way. So what I've done here is I've just set the shot bag underneath it. Uh, lead shot is what's in that bag. And I'll use my nylon hammer and it's a soft flat hammer. And the reason for the softer hammer is if I use a harder hammer a lot of times you'll end up stretching it even more. So I'll use a softer hammer it kind of helps me pull that back and consume some of that stretched metal. Help me shrink this back a little bit allows for me to, to basically remove the dent. And it has worked well for me in the past and, and in different applications. My objective is here is to get this thing flat. We're not using the skin over. It doesn't have to be perfect, but this will pull 95, 98% of what's bothering me here back out of the skin. Okay, so at this point, we're going to start weighing this down and laying it out to begin drilling it up. What I'm doing here is I'm just going to add as many weights as I can to hold the skin down flat. That's very important. I have this thing as, as even with the other skin as possible. Hole patterns are going to be worthless doing if I, I can't duplicate what this skin was. So, um, Anything that looks like it may be up, I want to make sure it's sitting hard up against the new part, the new metal. Um, make sure everything's clean. You've got to be careful with this being 25,000, so I'm setting everything down real careful so I don't uh, damage the new metal underneath. I'll look for damage along the way on the uh, new skin, and then if there is any, I'll make sure that I don't place my original skin over it so I'm not working with already damaged parts. So we always evaluate our, our skins as we go so we don't have any issues with the new part. Typically I would have butted this seam hard up against the edge of the new metal, but I had a little damage in here, so I moved it back and then I'll just shear cut that point of when the piece is drilled, but drilled up. What I'm doing now is I'm just looking over, making sure that I'm sitting flat, making sure that my edges are well within the new material. Start at one point or one corner. Going down into my table. I make sure that I drill into the table a little bit so when I set my Clico it holds it firm to the table. I like a lot of Clico so I'll go every three or four holes, hold this thing down. I'm going to run this whole line and then I'll sweep that way. I use a three quarter inch MDF board and it works really well for me. It stays super smooth, super straight. It, the Clecos hold well to it so I can actually drill my skins and use the table to my advantage to hold everything in place with the Clecos. Again, this is real thin metal so make sure when you're drilling you don't uh, put too much pressure down. And you actually dimple your new metal. That's not good. So again, it's very important that you don't add a lot of pressure when you're drilling. You'll watch when I drill, I'm kind of letting the drill do the work. I'm not transferring the efforts that I'm putting into it to cause slight dimples within the new skin. It's very easy to do with a thinner metal. Another thing to make sure of is if you have any countersunk holes in the original skin, a lot of times these thinner skins will be, um, the hole will open up from the countersink. So make sure that you made note if that's the case, so you don't put too large of a hole in your metal, which I'm dealing with all button on this one, so it'll be fine. You'll see the different colored Clecos here. Those are telling me what sizes they are. The uh, colors indicate simply just size. They come in several different sizes. 
The black is the larger of the two that I have out on the table there. Today I'm using the copper 1 8 and uh, the black are 532 or 21s and 30s if you go with a numerical drill. Another thing I make sure of when I uh, take a skin off is that there's any repairs been done so I'm not drilling a repair back into our new part so we can eliminate any holes that may not need to be here. Um, from the history of a lot of these old planes, a lot of them have been field repaired, so I make sure that I'm not adding a repair back into the new part, which again, this skin was, was good, but we check and make sure. I find by drilling these up in an even form, much like I'm laying out here every few holes, it's evenly holding my skin down to the new material so I don't create any warps or pockets in the, in the skin. So to sweep the way I'm doing is, is gonna keep that skin continually laying flat. So at this point, I've basically filled in every three or four holes with a Clico, drilled right on across like I've talked about. Now what I'm doing is just picking up the strays in between all the Clicos, kind of keep myself somewhat of a, an even sweep through so I don't leave it or miss any holes. Pretty easy to do when you're talking four, five, six hundred holes in a panel. Okay, so at this point what I'll do, I've picked up all my holes now. Um, I'll check everything, make sure I didn't miss any and then um, mark out my outside cutouts and um, pull my Clicos and uh, go to the shear and start cutting out all the, the areas that I can cut out on the shear and after that I'll hand cut out or um, shear off by hand the uh, areas that I have that aren't straight. So I'm going to use a Sharpie ultra fine line. Make sure you're getting a line right on the edge and then obviously I'm outside of the the original skin so I'll cut to where the blue line comes off or the marker line comes off. If I'm cutting to the line then I'm making the skin just that much too wide. If I go just past the, the mark then I'm going to where the original skin was. Skins like this for example are butted on this wing so it's very important that I get the accurate size. So I like to file my edges even if I shear them and then sand them with the sandpaper to get them real smooth. He burrs the edges as well as puts it as a real smooth surface so I don't have any dissimilar rough edges, so to speak. Also, you can see where I left the, the markings of what the metal is on the skin. What I'll try to do when I make skins for my own mental memory of what's the inside is I'll put this to the inside. That way if I have any bends to make, nine times out of ten your marks are out here, you'll see them, you'll know where to, where to make your bends, you'll know what's the outside and the inside. If you're dimpling the skin, whatever, it's a good reference point. At least it works for me. Sure, some will say that I used a lot of Clicos. Well, I, my objective is here is to hold this skin as flat to the new material as possible. So I don't get any any type of waves that I'm putting into the metal or anything. I, I want these holes to, to line up exactly like the original. That way the skin fits nice and snug to the uh, part that you Clico and rivet it to. first would have been done sooner. So as I get to the final Clicos here removing them and I pick up the skin you'll notice there's a lot of chips and debris from the drill out of the new skin. That's pretty normal so just simply blow that off and uh, get it out of my way. I'm looking over the skin now to more or less just make sure all my whole patterns are consistent.
it'd be pretty easy at the way it's sitting now even with the dust still sitting on there from the drill out I can then see if I see a, a space that I've missed where I may have not picked up all my holes then in that case if I was to find that I can simply place the skin back on there while it's still placed on the table and pick those up after adding a few Clecos to that area. So this is our Cincinnati 12 foot shear. This is the machine that I will use to cut out the bulk of my skin, remove any extra material, then any fine tuning I have to do, I can do with shears, cut off wheels, sander, whatever may need to be done. This is what we use. Uh, it's a cut on up to, I think, quarter inch mild steel. So it right on down to 20,000 skin. So it does a good job for us. This is a rack that me and Dave Martin had come up with for me in the shop. I work a lot by myself. It made it a lot more efficient to come up with something much similar to a uh, drywall uh, table, I guess we could say. Uh, this thing also pivots and swivels for me so I can load the skin from the sheet metal rack. And then uh, at a level point, it actually rolls right up to the shear and also to my table. Makes the job a little easier. Notice the lights above the shear, they shine straight down on where the shear comes down. As I lay this in place, I make note of where that line is that I've drawn on there with a the Sharpie marker and uh, follow that. So that's where I'm indicated as to where I'm cutting. I'm putting these in there. This is very thin metal. So I'm just going to place these little bumpers in here to kind of keep the pads when they come down from denting my material. These are just simple pieces of cardboard I've cut out. I found that the thinner metals, when those pads come down, they like to leave a little impression on the metal. I'm not sure that they're really doing any damage. I just tried to prevent any marks that I can keep out of there. A lot of times with these skins, they're not necessarily straight. So what I'll do is I'll find the average piece that it's going to eliminate bulk of the material. And that way I can then take it to my bench and remove the skin to the shape with the shears or sander or whatever may uh, work for that application. The lights, as you can see them now that I have them on, they're, they're, they're what I'm watching through that um, guard there. They're actually um, coming straight down. It's, it's pinpointing right where my marker line's at so I can get right on the money with where I would need to be with my cut. Okay, now back to the table. Okay, so I'm all cut to basic size. What I'm gonna do now is, is get right to my lines now with my, my more refined, smaller tools, simpler uh, way of putting it is, is um, the, the shear did what it needed to do with the bulk of it. So now I'm gonna clean it up and bring myself to, to the size of the skin of the original skin. What I have here is I have my 90 degree, it has a um, three inch Rolock um, Scotch-Brite disc on it. And at this point, I've already removed a little bit more material off there with a shear. What I'm doing now is just smoothing out my shear marks and any cuts, and then from here I'll go for sandpaper and filing. What I'm doing here is clicking the skin to the table. It's holding it in place, holding it firm so it doesn't move. I need to run down this edge with my sander and keep it 
uniform and straight. Tacking it to the table, it allows me to use both hands with a 90 degree so I can keep my sanding true. Here I'm just feathering out the edges. You can see a lot of material coming off. Just trying to get the burr off the edge. I'm not trying to round it or taper it or any of that. I'm just trying to simply remove any burr that may be on that edge from the sander. And then I'm final sanding it with, um, I think this is probably 400 grit. And all that's doing is just final feathering out uh, my sanding marks and where the file was. So it blends that edge and takes any imperfections off that edge. What I'm doing here is I'm, I'm lifting the skin off the table, as you see, and my next part of the project here is I've got to deburr these holes. Well, you're dealing with three, four, five hundred holes in a skin at times. Uh, to deburr for both sides is doubling your time, so I've got a really neat in and out deburring tool. Works real well, so you simply go in with the drill running, and as you come out with the drill running, it's deburring the hole on both sides. Very, very efficient, cool little tool to have. A lot of times, you know, we'll get pulled on another project or a hangar dump or something of that nature. So you'll find that this skin has actually taken me several months on and off to complete. It's not happening over a two or three day period as such. The calendar time is substantial. So at this point, I've drilled my uh, skin up, uh, deburred it, uh, sanded, uh, kind of scotch brighted the back side, uh, ready for, you know, to take primer. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I want to show you guys how to um, uh, sand and prep the surface for polish. Um, I usually order the aluminum in with a plastic uh, PVC type of coating on it just to protect it sitting in the rack. Uh, gets, you know, drug around, scratched around. When you drill it up, it's laying on its bottom. You have the chips scratch, etc. So kind of kind of keeps it protected. So it costs a few bucks more. And, um, saves a lot of grief for having to sand any scratches out of it. So I'm going to peel the plastic off now. It's uh, going to take a little bit of time because with all the holes in it, it's created tears, so it'll come off in little pieces. And with polished aluminum, typically what I'll do is I'll order it in in a bare form, meaning with no alclad coating. Alclad coating is a couple of thousandths thickness that usually comes on the surface to add protection to your skin. Um, with polishing it, you kind of, it, it gets in your way of giving you a crisp shine. So I prefer to sand, uh, or to, to make my pieces that are intended to polish at, with bare aluminum. And what that does is it gives me the actual material to sand and not having to sand through the alclad and polish that because uh, with that being a softer pure aluminum more or less it uh, it doesn't shine as, as crisp it gives you like a haze so and it, over a period of time you'll eventually start sanding or, or polishing through it and it'll end up um, giving you like a two-tone shine so I uh, generally like to, to build polished um, parts with the uh, bare aluminum. <clears throat> I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but there's grain in aluminum. I don't know if this will pick this up. It's running this way. And my objective is, is to go ahead and um, sand this out. So the next step I'll have with this is uh, I'll start with different grips of sandpaper on my 3-inch DA and uh, sand any scratches, any imperfections, um, the grain, everything else to make this as smooth as possible. It'll go with, like I said, several different grits of paper. Work my way all the way up to 2,000 grit by hand. Um, should take several hours to do that, this large piece of skin. So what I'm gonna do is start out with 320. I'll bump up to 400 and then 600. And probably go 1,000 with a DA. 
And then what I'll do is start wet sanding with 600, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. Some people may say that's a little bit extreme, but to me that's what works. It's keeping consistent with what I've done throughout the rest of the airplane. So uh, my theory is the works don't, uh, don't fix it. It's not broke. So I'm going to overlap this one section and take it step by step so I can share with you the, the process in doing this and then I'll carry on with the rest of the panel. It's definitely impossible to share with you the true time that this is going to take. What I'll do is I'll, I'll do this section here as I'm with different uh, grits, kind of show you where it'll end up when I'm done, so I don't have to uh, hold you up here too long. Now this is 400. It's important as you sand here, I'm keeping my sander flat, as you can see, and I'm trying to keep a consistent pattern because as you overlap and you go over at once, you almost camouflage um, where you've been and what you're doing. So you're kind of watching your, your pattern and your, your lap. So you go over everything a couple of times and let the sandpaper work to its best of its ability. Now if I wanted to, I could do this whole process by hand with wet sanding. I just choose to try to speed it up with the sander kind of gives me a jump start on it in some cases what I'll do is I'll start polishing once I go over it with a wet sand see that I may leave scratches or any imperfections away it'll kind of highlight them with a polish and then I'll go back into it again with 1500 2000 and kind of clean those areas up I might have missed because as you sand this it kind of camouflages some of what might be in there so as you shine it, it highlights them, and then you can get back into it again and re-sand it <clears throat> to get those last little bits of things you don't want in there when your finished product's done. This is 600 grit. not really removing a whole lot of material. Probably something someone's gonna ask along the way. I've never really mic'd it to see if I, how much I'm removing, if any, but I don't think it's very significant at all. Probably lose more when you're forming parts than doing a little of this. Okay, so this is a thousand. This is pretty much where I'll start, uh, stop. It's pretty much where I'll stop with the DA this thousand grit and then I'll jump into wet sanding once the whole panel sanded with the DA then I'll, I'll jump into wet sanding a uh, 600,000, 1500, 2000 um, like I've mentioned you know some people may think that's extreme you got jewel rouges and polishes that'll bring a lot of this up from this point that's true I, I find that the sanding is giving me a much cleaner smoother finish I'm looking for that chrome look, that polished aluminum look that's so vibrant. Uh, so by doing that, I, I take those extra steps. Um, from 10 feet away, you don't notice the difference, but when you get up on it, you'll certainly notice the efforts that's been put into it to take it that extra step. I wipe the panel off between each sanding coat just simply to remove the dust that I've created. The more material you leave down on the panel, your 
risking scratching it. So that's where I'll take this. I'm going to go ahead and continue on through the rest of the panel. And then we'll take it to outside of the table and, and wet sand it. And uh, like I said, we'll probably have two or three hours into the process of doing this. Uh, I don't know, what is this, about an eight, nine foot skin by two foot at the widest point. So a uh, little bit of time involved in polishing a plane, but the end results are, if done right, are pretty, pretty cool. Again, it's impossible to show you the, the whole skin process here. I'll, I'll have you here for four hours. Okay, so at this point I've gone through the whole skin process of 320, 400, 600, and 1,000. So my next step at this uh, point will go to set up my outdoor uh, wet sanding area to accommodate the skin. I'll sand it with 600 wet sand, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000. Once that's done, then I'll bring it inside and start polishing and um, bringing it up to a high shine if, uh, if I did everything right. So we're at the point now where after I've DA'd the, the whole skin, um, I'm out here now ready to wet sand. And um, as I talked about, I start with about a 600 grit wet sand, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000. And what that'll do is eliminate any of the grain that's left from the aluminum, any DA marks, any scratches or imperfections. So a little bit of a process, but the end results are definitely um, explain why I do it this way. You want to keep your surface wet. It helps cut as well as keeps the different debris and everything off the off the panel so you're not grinding in any imperfections into the into the metal as you go. I'll go one direction then the other direction. This is 600 grit. I'm just going to do a section kind of give you an idea of what the end results are going to be. This will probably take me about two hours or so to do this whole skin. Start to finish with the sanding process. The reason I'm doing this before I put it on the the airplane um, is for a couple of reasons. One, it's easy to get to this way. Two, it's very messy. So I can get most of it polished up at this point. The other thing is once you put your button headed rivets in the skin and you haven't polished it, you'll never get polishing crisp around the edges of your rivet. So if I do it this way, then I'm getting the surface polished under the rivet more or less and, and to the rivet so everything looks even and shiny. Then you go back over it again once it's assembled and uh, it will uh, polish up even more, allow you to polish the rivet head and bring the skin up the rest of the way. We'll show you that process down the road. All right, I've got that section with 600. I'm gonna go ahead and go with a thousand now. See, I have my papers all laid out in here accordingly. Try to hose everything off, keep the dust and dirt off. This is thousand. I prefer using 3M but there's many different papers out there that work good as well. <clears throat> as I get through the different layers and the grits of paper, I should say, it'll start actually putting almost a shine on the metal. And that'll help me also see any imperfections that might be left behind. Now through this process, you got to pull your metal out of your rack, check and make sure it's not dented or damaged. You drill it up, then you have to check and make sure you haven't damaged it in any way that way. And then you cut it to size, deburr it, um, DA it, sand it like I am now, 
and get the polish. All these steps you have to make sure you're not getting any fog in here anywhere to cause you any grief. There's no paint going on this outside surface, so what you see is what you get. And as you polish it, it uh, magnifies any imperfections, any dents, any anything. Even when you shoot your rivet, you watch the rivet pull tight to the material, it'll even leave like a noticeable um, visual of the uh, rivet doing that. <clears throat> That's pretty good with thousand. Starting to get a shine on there. I don't know if the camera's picking that up. With thousand, I'm gonna go to fifteen hundred. Again, I'm gonna close off my paper. Just try to make sure I'm not, tra sure I'm not trapping any pieces of sand or any anything in here. Do this outside for obvious reasons. I don't need to trash the shop with water. This is 1500. If any of you paint, you do this same process when you wet sand your clear coat or your paint before you polish it. It's exactly the same process and concept. You'd be taking the orange peel off your paint. Well, here I'm taking the grain and little imperfection and unevenness off the aluminum that it has. I may change direction slightly in the sanding just to kind of see my pattern, where I'm going, where I've been. As you go to the finer paper, it's going to wear out a little faster. You are sanding metal, so it's going to wear it out, so make sure you're not stingy with rotating your paper and changing it out as you need it. Okay, I'm gonna jump up to the 2000 now. They're marked on the back, so I'm sure a lot of you guys know that. Just doing this one section here, so you see how much time is involved in doing this, but uh, I haven't found any other ways to skip many steps that I've shown you to not without sacrificing the end results where I'm headed with the finish. Now I'm going to get this in the polish in a couple hours and find out that I, I have some spots that are showing that I didn't see in the finish of the sanding, then um, as I shine it up, it'll magnify those areas. And I can come out here and touch up those particular spots and then go back into it and repolish it. I don't know if the camera's picking that up, but it's gotten it pretty much where you can almost catch a reflection in there. A lot of that's the water too, but the metal's doing that as well. So at that point, that section is more or less ready for polish. I'll continue that down the rest of this step and the rest of the skin. So that kind of wraps up part one. Uh, part two will be the polishing, painting afterwards in the interior section of the skin, side of the skin. We have install in there as well as riveting. So look forward to seeing you for part two.